Okay, I think we're going to go ahead and get started so if folks can take their seats, that'd be great. Hopefully everybody had a chance to have a pleasant dinner last night and get, get a little time to relax. Uh, we had really great sessions yesterday and I'm sure the same will be true today. So uh, we're going to start off, I'm going to turn it over to Terry for a brief uh, review of what we heard yesterday. Great, thanks Rex, and, and good morning everyone. Um, uh, glad to see you. We do have a couple of people who either got ill during the night or not anything that we fed them, um, or or their children did, um, so so we may be a little bit sparser, so um, so want to be sure everybody uh, who is who is still here uh, actively participates. Um, you remember yesterday we started off with sort of a groundwork laying session, um, talking about principles, uh, basic principles of testing for disease and risk, which is something that's a little bit new for genomicists, looking at the risk aspects. Uh, there seem to be general agreement that addressing tier one conditions um, is, is probably a good consensus starting point, but then the question is, should we add something else uh, in terms of population screening and how do we make those decisions? I'm not sure we decided that, but that was one of the questions that would raise, was raised. Um, there was a uh, suggestion that maybe we need a, a Richards criteria option for selecting screening tests, uh, much as we, we had for um, uh, variant curation. Uh, and the importance of, of studying more of the biology of penetrance, which uh, our, our, our colleagues, my colleagues on the, on the basic science side of the house and yours in basic science uh, would be well uh, set up to do. Uh, we also talked a lot about uh, genomic screening technologies, uh, the importance of setting a high bar for uh, implementing technologic advances when we're talking about population screening as opposed to research. Um, uh, Bob emphasized uh, the need to assess compound heterozygotes um, and something that we don't do uh, as well or as, as perhaps as actively as we might. Uh, and the, the need to kind of lay out the handoff of positive tests to clinical providers, which in the newborn screening setting is handled somewhat by the state labs. There doesn't really seem to be anyone who's doing that um, uh, in, in the adult setting. Uh, and a lot of talk also about how people interpret negative tests, both patients and providers, and, and uh, the importance of studying that. Um, and talking about the logistics of population screening, there was uh, somewhat of a, a little debate about, you know, is, is primary care better set up? Is our specialists more interested? Uh, how do we thread that needle? Um, presumably both can be involved, but how we, we set that up is uh, an important um, question. Uh, a lot of emphasis on the importance of meaningful engagement from the outside of a program and incorporating um, social determinants of health in, in that. Um, and then when in the community engagement um, session, uh, uh, the, the importance of learning from the community what their values and aspirations are rather than those of the researchers. Uh, hopefully you can meet both. Um, the, the point was made that, you know, modeling on, on what is done in tribal communities, that there are most other marginalized communities don't have those kinds of formalized structures and how then uh, do we figure out who the community is and how we reach them. Um, and then uh, uh, wouldn't it be nice if we could identify tests that are sort of almost ready for prime time, that we could then um, do whatever research is needed to, to sort of fill those gaps. So, so that was um, our, our day yesterday, which was very active and very productive. Um, our day today, is, as you've probably seen, uh, we'll, we'll be looking at evidence needed to support screening, obstacles to screening, uh, and then we'll have three talks sort of summarizing the research directions that people have heard uh, uh, so far in the meeting. And we will uh, refine these, send, send summaries out to you all to comment on um, and kind of go from there. With that, I think we turn this over to our session chairs who are Pat and Dan. Take it. Good morning, everyone. Um, this is session five, the evidence needed to support screening. Dan Roden and I are going to be facilitating this. It will be the same format as yesterday. We will have our speakers. And um, after the presentations, we'll have ample time for questions. So uh, our first speaker this morning is Mark Williams from Geisinger, who, and he's also a member of the genomic work group that organized this meeting. And Mark's going to talk about the value proposition for population genomic screening. Great, thank you very much. Um, thanks for the opportunity to talk about one of my favorite things. So um, what I'm gonna do today is to um, provide uh, at least um, uh, a definition of value in the healthcare context. And then I wanna explore the concept of value from different stakeholder perspectives and then propose some areas uh, where we could be uh, doing some research into value in population genomic screening. So 
What is value? Uh, it's some sort of a relationship between outcomes and cost of care. Uh, Michael Porter, um, who's one of the leading proponents of uh, uh, value measuring in healthcare, uh, defines it as value in healthcare is a measured improvement in a person's health outcomes for the cost of achieving that improvement. Not being a health economist, um, I try to think, thing, uh, think about things in a more simplistic way, and so I came up with this uh, uh, model of a uh, three-by-three uh, grid where uh, we have medical service or some other outcomes on the left-hand side that can Im be improved, can be unchanged, or can worsen, and then the cost of care across the top that can decrease, be unchanged, or increase. And uh, obviously, we would like to be up in the upper left-hand corner in the green uh, and want to avoid the lower. And just some examples, uh, many, if not most, immunizations would fall into the improved outcomes with decreased cost of care. That's been one of our major success stories in medicine. Uh, if we look at molecularly targeted cancer therapies, um, these tend to fall into the in improved outcomes, but also increased cost of care. Uh, these are new medications, they're expensive medications, but in many cases they're providing treatments for um, previously untreatable uh, diseases. And at least by the proxy of reimbursement, uh, that our society in the United States at least has made the decision that there's sufficient value uh, in the in outcome improvement that we will pay for that therapy. Uh, one of the most egregious examples of uh, worsening outcomes with increased cost of care was the uh, short-lived uh, use of bone marrow transplantation for advanced uh, breast cancer, which is an interesting case study that I don't have time to go into. But unfortunately, the, one of the reasons that we have the economic situation in healthcare in this country that we have is that we spend a lot of time down in the lower right-hand corner of this grid. Um, so how about perspectives on outcomes? There's lots of different kinds of outcomes that we can look at. There are medical outcomes, uh, things like morbidity and mortality, disease-free survival, treatment effectiveness and safety, and relevant to a screening program, preventive services. Um, there are patient-centered outcomes. Many of these are around service, uh, satisfaction, timeliness, access to care, uh, health behavior changes, empowerment and engagement, knowledge and personal utility. Healthcare systems themselves have outcomes that they measure that are not necessarily aligned with uh, either of these, although there is overlap. Um, they're interested in the cost that they incur and avoid, the utilization of their services. There are aspects to visibility and reputation and patient experience. And then, of course, there are cost outcomes. And we want to use standardized costs associated with the interventions in health states experienced by the patient. So for an example would be a cost per outcome, like a cost per quality. Um, the problem is, is that measuring costs in the United States, at least, is extremely difficult. We know a lot about charges. We don't know a lot about costs. Now, I want to break down medical outcomes just a bit, because within medical outcomes, uh, there are really three categories that we uh, can look at as we assess this. Um, the easiest to measure are process outcomes. Did somebody do something? Did you get a lipid panel? Did you get a colonoscopy? Did you get a mammogram? Um, but these are pretty distal to the outcome of interest. Uh, so sometimes we rely on intermediate outcomes, which are a bowel marker or some other sort of a marker uh, that can be associated either positively or negatively with a particular health outcome. So LDL cholesterol and um, uh, arteriosclerotic cardiovascular disease would be an example there. But at the end of the day, we're really interested in health outcomes, which is the change of the health of an individual or group of people or population that's attributable to a given intervention. The challenge with health outcomes is that many times the actual health outcome may occur years or decades after the intervention, and that's why we tend to rely on some of these intermediate and process outcomes. So we've heard a lot over the last few years about the idea of moving towards value-based health care. So what are we really talking about here? And so value-based care is meant to transform the health care system to create more value for patients, however we define value. Um, but I think there's some uh, conflations here that are not accurate. Uh, a focus on cost reduction without improvement in outcomes is incomplete, although a reduction of costs for the same outcomes would, in fact, 
uh, be a uh, um, value add because we're achieving the same outcome for lower cost. Uh, value-based healthcare is not the same as quality, although quality is a component of value-based healthcare because in most cases, if you improve the quality of a process, you improve outcomes and many times uh, reduce cost. Uh, patient satisfaction is not equivalent, equivalent to value-based care, but uh, Michael Porter would strongly argue that if we don't understand outcomes from the perspective of the patient, then we are likely to miss the boat. And then improving patient experience associated with the value-based outcome does enhance value from the patient perspective. And I, this is uh, taken from one of um, the articles by uh, Teisberg, who's a um, colleague of uh, Michael Porter's, uh, where they really, uh, I thought, laid out a very nice way to think about value-based healthcare that is centered around understanding the shared health needs of patients. So this engagement piece to define the outcomes of interest uh, to a patient using that to design solutions to improve the outcomes, and then um, uh, basically implement that while measuring both outcomes and cost, and then ultimately, if you find things that are working, then disseminate that and expand partnerships. So let's drill down a little bit into more of the genomic population screening. I'm gonna come back to one of our favorite topics that we've heard about frequently during this meeting, which is the CDC tier one conditions. And I'm really gonna give you a very quick snapshot of two uh, examples uh, from the CDC Tier 1 conditions, outcomes from the MyCode Community Health Initiative, and then um, a, a, a very brief uh, uh, view of the cost-effectiveness study from uh, the Rational Integration of Clinical Sequencing Study. So the MyCode project, we published a Tier 1 outcomes paper in 2020. Uh, looking at the clinical utility of genomic screening uh, for the CDC Tier 1 conditions, 350 patients uh, with variants that are associated with hereditary breast and ovarian cancer, lymph syndrome, or familial hypercholesterolemia, did double-coded chart review, uh, and uh, had a median follow-up of uh, nearly uh, two years. Um, as we heard, um, most people were not aware that they had a Tier 1 variant. Um, the vast majority of them were also eligible to perform risk management, and we were um, very gratified to see that 68% of these individuals actually performed some management uh, post-disclosure. So this information seemed to carry some value to them. Uh, we also were able to make uh, specific diagnoses uh, in that follow-up period in about 13% of individuals, a clinical diagnosis in addition to the molecular diagnosis. And that supports the effectiveness of genomic screening programs um, uh, in uh, individuals with uh, um, previously undetected individuals. Um, so we did demonstrate some, out, uh, some aspects of clinical utility. The outcomes were mostly process outcomes, imaging, procedure, analyte analysis with a, a sprinkling of intermediate outcomes like LDL lowering and polyp removal. No health outcomes were measured within that short of, uh, period of time. And we did not measure cost, so we did not assess uh, value because we did not have the cost piece. Now, I'm not going to talk much about this because the ne next talk is going to be solely focused on this. But uh, using uh, some of the, the MICO data plus uh, data in the literature, we um, in this project did cost effectiveness studies. And when we looked at individual conditions, we saw that um, a population screening approach for hereditary breast and ovarian cancer syndrome uh, was cost effective by the uh, threshold of $100,000 per quality adjusted life year in this country. And then we com uh, combined the three, uh, we found that there was cost effectiveness for screening uh, before the age of 40. Um, again, I do this only to say if we were to use that information, that is a value measurement. Cost effectiveness measures outcomes versus cost. And that would plop us up into the upper right-hand corner there where we've improved outcomes at an acceptable cost. Um, I think outcomes definition and standardization is really critical here. If we're going to do research, we all have to be measuring the same thing. Outcomes are critical to determining the utility and value. Uh, we're really just beginning to collect uh, outcome uh, measures for genomic medicine. A lot of NHGRI and NIH-funded programs are collecting outcomes, and then there are other institutions which are also uh, doing this uh, as well. I just want to give three quick examples about how we can begin to think about um, harmonizing outcomes. In eMERGE 3, 
Uh, we worked with the ClinGen Action Ability Working Group to compare health outcomes that were being captured in Emerge 3 with uh, the ClinGen uh, outcome intervention pairs, and we identified concordance and discordance as a starting point for harmonization. Uh, that was published uh, in 2018. Um, Ignite um, created a number of outcome measures which are currently represented in the Phoenix Toolkit. Uh, they have an extensive list of outcome measures from different sources with validated tools. However, a relative minority of them actually are focused around medical outcomes. And th that was published in Genetics and Medicine. And then CSER II um, developed a number of survey measures and outcomes, um, including clinical outcomes, healthcare utilization, and health economics. And they engaged not only with um, clinicians, but also with payers and other policymakers to make sure that we also paid attention to outcomes that were of interest to these groups. And they came up with this graphic that um, illustrates the idea that the perspective that you take is really important. And you can see on the left-hand side here that we have to take into consideration populations, timing, the various conditions, uh, and data sources. Um, so outcomes definitions and standardization, I think, is going to be essential as an underpinning to research uh, in uh, genomics. Um, we need to uh, foster engagement with broader stakeholder groups to expand outcomes that would contribute to a more holistic consideration of value and that the definition of health outcomes is of most important uh, from the patient perspective, that we need to understand what the patients are looking for as health outcomes, and we use that to uh, orient ourselves. We have to make sure we're using standardized definitions of cost and capture those costs. And in conclusion, I'd just like to again uh, return to a quote from Michael Porter. Value in healthcare is determined in addressing the patient's particular medical condition over the full cycle of care, from monitoring and prevention to treatment to ongoing disease management. So here I think we're talking about that monitoring and prevention uh, stage as part of a screening program. And so I uh, thank you very much for um, your kind attention. Look forward to the discussion. Well done, Mark. Uh, under time. Our next speaker is Dave Veenster from the University of Washington. He's going to talk um, in more detail about that cost effectiveness study that Mark showed. <clears throat> Great. Thanks a lot, Pat. And thanks to the organizers for inviting me to speak today. Uh, David Veenster, University of Washington. And I'm a health economist and decision modeler. And we've applied some of these tools to try to get at the issue of cost effectiveness. And I'll talk a little bit about that example, but I want to talk about kind of the broader landscape of population screening using genomics. Sorry. Uh, I think uh, Mark kind of covered some of these key points here, um, you know, just about cost in healthcare and value and why people are increasingly interested in it. There are formal methods, cost effectiveness analysis that have been used, developed and used over the past 30 to 40 years. And slowly over time, you're seeing increased use of these formal methods um, across the world and increasingly also in the United States. Um, so that's kind of the framework that we've used. Now, Mark had a nice chart that is a different version of this is the classic cost effectiveness person will show you this. They call it the cost effectiveness plane. And it's the same thing. It's just showing, look, your costs go up or down and your outcomes improve or they don't. Um, most things in the US upper right quadrant means they cost more and they improve outcomes. And that's why you, where you want to say, hey, how, what am I getting for my money spent? So th this is a study that's been cited a few times. Um, this is a, a project we actually worked on for about five years, uh, a nice group of collaborators from University of Washington, Vanderbilt, and Geisinger, uh, and Greg Guzaskis, who's actually has a PhD in public health genomics from University of Washington, uh, was the lead modeler uh, on this project. Um, I, you guys have heard about these CDC Tier 1 conditions, so I won't go into that. This is just a schematic of this model. Um, as Les said, it, it's a bunch of, it, it's all probabilities, and that's what these models are. They're really, they're not about cost. These are just a bunch of probabilities multiplied together. And Jonathan um, showed you, like, the next step, going beyond just probabilities, starting to multiply those together, getting number needed to treat, and those types of things. And these models just do that. They say, what's the probability of this happening? What's the probability of that happening? And all those things we've talked about, the Reverend Bayes is in there somewhere, um, number needed to treat. But we say, 
at the end of the day, if people have this information, a certain proportion of them will act on it. That will help prevent future disease. That will save a life. That will save life years. Uh, that will improve quality of life. And uh, we measure all these things call, uh, using a standard metric in health economics called the quality adjusted life year. It's basically a year of life with good quality of life. That's all it is. If it sounds confusing, just think of it as a life year. What else do I want to say? This is a simplified schematic um, uh, of the overall model. And we just basically used a decision model up front. You just separate people into different types of people, people with variants where you know about it, people with variants you don't know about it. And once you kind of have them in those different buckets, then we use this longer term simulation model uh, over in the bottom right hand corner there. And we just we track what happens to people over time. At, at some point, they might get a cancer, for example. And what would happen to them? Might they die from that? What are the costs for that? What's the impact on their quality of life? And we just track them over time. That's, that's what these models are doing. Um, Getting some of the inputs for the model uh, was challenging, even though these are pr fairly well-known conditions. Kind of at the last minute during revisions in response to reviewers, we were fortunately able to get some nice estimates of prevalence uh, across different ancestries from the Healthy Nevada project. Um, so that, that, was, that was quite nice. And um, you can see the estimates there. And we need more data on this. I think we'll be seeing this coming out of the All of Us study, for example. Um, but maybe not quite as much variability um, across all three as we expected, but within the different syndromes, there is some variability. I just want to mention that, you know, the costs were it's pretty inexpensive, pretty, you know, relatively speaking, the, the costs that we estimated. There are some commercial tests out there in this ballpark of around $250. Um, so we felt that was reasonable. And I just wanted to mention that we did assume that um, people who tested positive got confirmatory testing. Now we say here at Sanger, we didn't really know exactly what to assume, uh, whether you know, you're going to run a, a test that's better than next-gen sequencing, you're going to get a new sample, what's going to happen there. But we did account for that. And for there's a really good discussion about false positives. Um, I think it's pretty clear, especially for um, conditions where there's um, intense medical interventions like hereditary breast cancer. You, you would want to do confirmatory testing. Um, I sensed a, a maybe concern about the hassle of doing that or the cost of doing that, but I would say from a cost effectiveness standpoint, it doesn't matter. If that test costs uh, 200 bucks to do a confirmatory test and only 1% of your population has a positive finding, you're adding like $2 to the cost of your upfront test. It's, it's not a huge issue in terms of overall value. Um, so that is something that we included. Sorry, there's a lot of little small numbers here. I, actually, I think I meant to take this slide out, but it reminds me to tell you that we did not assume uh, that people just did uh, what the recommendation was. Okay, that's not what happens in the real world. And um, you know, we, we looked at, especially for uh, HBOC, you know, women make decisions about mastectomy and oophorectomy, and they implement those interventions over time at different ages. And these are important things to consider. Some previous work uh, in the field has just assumed that everybody goes and gets that intervention, which is ridiculous. And we've talked a lot about, you know, how do people behave? And that's, you know, this, these models are all about probabilities, but one of the most important things in them is how do people behave? What's the uptake of the intervention? So we included that. We also built a whole <clears throat> uh, uh, kind of submodel look at within the family cascade testing and what impacts that had. We had pretty um, modest assumptions about how many people would pursue that. Um, this slide is just to say, and I think Mark just said, is that if you look at e screening for each condition individually, it's generally not cost effective. Maybe for HBOC and, and a younger patient population, and, and these numbers, dollar sign per quality, just to orient you, about $100,000 is how much seems reasonable to spend to get one extra year of life with good quality of life. So that's, the, that's kind of a rough metric for you. And um, it's also influenced by age, generally more cost effective when, it's, when people are younger for obvious reasons, you're able to intervene, they have that information on time, et cetera. So we did three separate studies, each of these one at a time, um, some promise, um, but really not coming together as a whole. But the key really is when you combine all these conditions, and this is just showing um, on the x-axis, it's showing uh, the results 
uh, at different ages of screening. So this isn't over time. These are different cohorts of people of different ages. And on the y-axis is really the clinical benefit measured by equality. And you can see the contribution from the different syndromes, which I think is kind of neat. Um, you can see cascade testing helps out. It, it doesn't, it's not an overwhelming driver of clinical benefit. And that all of these things together really are kind of needed uh, to provide sufficient clinical benefit uh, to justify cost effectiveness, as I'll show on the, the next slide. And again, you can see that um, more cost effective in a younger patient population. There's another chart. Again, sorry, these are uh, kind of information dense in, in, in some ways. Here again, we have on the x-axis age at time of screening. And on the y-axis, we have actually, you know, what's the value, the cost per quality. And that $100,000 per quality is the horizontal line across there. And these, these error bars just re represent uncertainty with probabilistic simulations. And it's just saying, hey, let's take all three of these together at the same time. What are the results and uh, the probability uh, that it's cost effective? And you can see under about 40, um, pretty likely cost effective based on the inputs and the assumptions that we modeled. And we do, we vary all of our estimates and probabilities. We don't assume anything's fixed. So we try to account for uncertainty as best we can. Um, what else do I want to say here? I guess, I guess one thing I want to say is these kinds of cost effectiveness studies, health economic studies, we don't calculate p-values. These are more Bayesian in nature. The, it's not very often when you see interventions where even when you look at the uncertainty, you're still below 100,000 per uh, quality. So it's a pretty fairly robust findings, I would say. Um, and these um, stood up to various different scenario analyses. But I think there are still some remaining questions that have been discussed here um, yesterday and today. Um, again, sorry for the dense chart. This is just showing these are all these different what if scenarios we ran. We said, what if the, the test costs more? What if there's a 50% relative decrease in, in follow-up, adherence to follow-up? You lose your cost effectiveness, okay, things like that. And there was also um, been some discussion about false reassurance, which I actually think is, uh, is one of the more important or most important issues that we should be looking at. Um, we made some rough estimates of, you know, if a certain percent of people, say 10% of women decided to not pursue routine uh, mammography screening, for example, and lost uh, a little bit of clinical benefit there. All of a sudden, all the benefit you got from finding those one, the, the one, one and a half percent of people is gone. So there's so many people that don't have a positive test result. You need to be very pretty confident that they're, they're not going to change their behavior. And there's, there's, been, there's been some studies on this. There's been tidbits. There's been intention to pursue different activities. But um, I think this is an area that's ripe for research. Um, I think Caitlin mentioned this, too. This is a good area for research. The nice thing is uh, you've got power. You've got sample. You, it's not 1% of the people that you can study. You can study the 98, 99% of people. Okay, so you've got the sample size. The hard part is that you have to design the study well. Um, you want to have a control group. You want to look at, you can look at their behavior before and after they, the test. And ideally, you'd have a control group and you look at the difference in the control group and the difference before and after in the intervention group. So there's, there's kind of a, a nice observational study designs you can use to do this. So I expect now that a lot of these programs are being rolled out. We'll be seeing more information on this. And it's also important to consider what happens to the quote unquote negatives. Were they just not told anything about the test result? Like maybe they, nothing came across to them. So that's, people are going to behave one way based on that. Maybe there, it pops up in their medical record. Uh, unlikely, but possible they would talk to a genetic counselor. Now, those people might behave differently depending on how that quote unquote uh, negative or non positive result was returned. And so those are all issues um, that I think are extremely ripe for study. Uh, I just want to kind of switch gears here a little bit and switch away from the tier ones and talk a little bit about polygenic risk scores. We've just started some work in this area, um, getting a sense of it. And it's, it's very different, OK? You're, you're, the proportion of people that you're telling, hey, you're a little higher, you're higher risk, you maybe want to do something a little different, it's not. It's not 1%, right? It's, it's 10, 20 times higher than that. It's 10 or 20% of the population. But their lifetime risks are, you know, these, these are not hereditary conditions. The lifetime risks are much lower. And you potentially have many, many conditions, which 
uh, is is potentially somewhat analogous to the um, tier one conditions as you add things on. Um, so just kind of covering these, and you know, these are just like kind of a toy example back of the envelope calculation. But you know, my sense of it is the prevalence is higher, but your overall clinical benefit is is lower per patient, and so and and more it's more so. And um, so I think that cost effectiveness in this realm of polygenic risk scores is not going to be the same as CDC tier one. I think it's going to be more challenging. And I came up with these toy examples here, a very simple model um, to generate this graph. And this is just showing, um, I don't know what X and Z is here, but kind of on the left bottom side there is your incremental clinical benefit. It's going up as you go back. On the right side is the prevalence of the variant, and that goes down as you go back. And then on the y-axis is really value. So red's bad, blue's good. And this is about where the tier ones look like. So as the benefit uh, per person that you find with a variant uh, changes, the value changes. And as the prevalence of the variant changes, the value changes. But the big picture here is that for a reasonable combinations of numbers, you're below that 100,000. You're in the blue or the yellow. Okay, So you're in the right space. You kind of can play around there. You've got some opportunity. Uh, when I run this stuff for rough, very rough estimates for polygenic risk scores, it does not look the same. Okay, you've got this tiny little corner down there where, oh yeah, I might be cost effective. And so um, I think I think there's going to be some very interesting work here. I think is that my sound? Okay, good. Uh, combining conditions is going to be critical. I've got a damn one minute or two. Minutes. So um, I'm going to skip newborn screening. It's a very different world. I think the main implications, um, I think we've heard this from other speakers, you know, the, the pre prevalence drives economic value more than, like, don't focus on cost. It's really about the prevalence, okay, uh, of the variance, of the underlying condition, et cetera. We really have to have clinical action uh, with, a, with an intervention that provides clinical benefit to show traditional economic value. There's some work that could be done looking at value uh, to families and things like that. Um, and I think that the, this issue around clinical actions is super important. There's a very nice paper, I think it just came out this week, uh, from Jody Linder, who, who's here in the audience, from Emerge 3, looking at kind of what, what did people do after they received monogenic findings, um, a nice example where there was a control group. I am a co-author, <laughs> full disclosure. So, um, I, I'm hoping to see more studies uh, similar to this one coming out. And then again, look, it needs to be efficient and relatively inexpensive. And I think a lot of those issues were, were touched on. I think um, one speaker might have been Mike talked about, well, where is this actually going to end up happening in the public or private sector? Um, I, you know, it's not clear to me. It's happening in both right now, but I think things will um, begin to move very quickly. So just in summary, um, so I want to say three things. Number one, the CDC tier one is a great model for population screening. Don't mess it up. <laughs> the trick here, you got to hold two ideas in your head at the same time. You have to combine conditions to get good value. But if you start throwing t lots of other conditions in there without careful evaluation, I like the dripping water faucet analogy. Maybe we can get to a, a pressure washer, but not a fire hose. You're going to don't ruin the value here. Don't confuse people. So being very careful about how to add conditions, and I think coming up with methods and approaches to figure out how to do that in a way that resonates with the evidence-based medicine folks and clinicians and patients is going to be the trick. And then last point is that genomic screening, you've seen one, you've seen one. Okay, Each different application is totally different in terms of uh, economic value. And with that, um, I'll wrap it up. Just thank my collaborators. Um, uh, Josh Peterson, uh, who's here, and Jing Hao, also uh, co-PIs, and Greg Guzaskis, who did the vast majority of that work that I showed you. Thanks. My, uh, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm slow. So the next two speakers are, um, are remote, so I hope they're on. Uh, Bruce? Yeah, he's next. Bruce, no, no, I mean, Bruce, are you on? Yes, yes. I'm here. Yes. Uh, I hope you're not excessively uh, viral loaded. Uh, 
So Bruce uh, Korf from the University of Alabama talking about uptake and follow-up. Uh, evidence of uptake and action in response to screening programs. Thank you. Yeah, clever as this virus is, I don't think it's going to transmit through the um, internet. Okay, so I was asked to talk about um, evidence of uptake and action, and I'm going to focus on something you heard about yesterday from Kelly East, namely the Alabama Genomic Health Initiative, which is a state-funded project that is a collaboration between uh, UAB and Hudson Alpha, which Kelly mentioned yesterday. And I'm not going to repeat everything she said. I, I'm going to try to focus mostly on the motivations of people to participate and um, also, as you'll see, um, the motivations of health providers. It began in 2017 with two cohorts. The rare disease cohort were basically people getting whole genome sequencing to establish a diagnosis not relevant for today's discussion. The initial population cohort was any adult in Alabama, and they would get genotyping using um, what was originally a a global screening array and then evolved to the global diversity array um, and a return of actionable variants with genetic counseling and introduction to supportive care. The initial demographics um, were not ones that we were particularly proud of. Um, the proportion particularly of Black or African-American participants was lower than the um, the demographics in the state. And um, it was um, more heavily weighted towards um, uh, female than male participation. We did, however, cover all the counties in the state, sometimes by working out with local providers to create pop-up enrollment sites. And, um, you know, that did help us to increase the diversity, but not to the extent that we ultimately did accomplish with the kind of a second version of this. And um, our return of results were based on the ACMG secondary findings, fully aware that that wasn't what they were designed for. I was part of the group actually that, that created that. Um, but it seemed at the time to be a list that could make sense for um, this kind of activity. And it was about one and a half percent, realizing that by doing this through a genotyping array, we were missing a significant proportion of, um, of variants. And also we learned from this that the array has lots and lots of false positives. Uh, we did a CLIA Sanger validation of anything that we returned though. So we have high confidence in what we returned. This was the, the list. It was a moving target, of course, because it gradually changed um, over the years. And we did try to keep up with it. Things in red are things where we had at least one return of results, usually many. And it ranged from people who already knew that they had something, even sometimes the thing that we found, to folks that were completely unaware. And um, some who, I think one of the more interesting cases early on was somebody who had had a heart transplant um, and had a family history of cardiomyopathy, but had no idea why. And that may be a, a kind of sad statement more on the way um, care was provided than on uh, population screening, but pretty wide diversity of, of findings. But it was actually difficult to track outcomes because these were people whose care could be anywhere in the state and generally took the information well through a genetic counselor who reported it, but it wasn't so easy to figure out after the fact where they were getting care and, and what was found. We did survey them uh, to try to get a sense of um, what their motivations for participation were. Two thirds claimed to be interested in contributing to research, um, almost as many concern about a future health problem, um, some were just curious. Um, many, about a third, had more um, an interest in what this could mean to um, members of their family. And um, then uh, there were a few who were adopted and didn't know much about family history. So, so this is a way of uh, maybe filling a gap. The one that worried us the most was um, close to the bottom, that this um, provided access to testing that insurance wouldn't pay for. Um, we really emphasized in any of the publicity about this, in the informed consent process, and in the return of results letter, which usually was we didn't find anything that was actionable, that this did not substitute for routine clinical testing if you had a family history, let's say, of uh, breast cancer, for example. Um, and I'm not totally sure that that message got through in spite of it having been hammered home multiple times. Um, and, you know, we we would miss 
some pathogenic variants, given the way we were doing this, and we weren't looking at all the genes you would look at if you actually had a clinical indication. Um, so aside from false reassurance, um, just in general, there was um, particular false reassurance in circumstances where you actually had reason not to be reassured. And if you look across the entire um, group who were tested, this is not focusing just on those with positive results. Not many made insurance changes. Um, lots said they were paying more attention to health and wellness, though it's a little hard to know what that means. And the proportion who had actual follow-up tests and exams and so forth matches pretty well with the ones that got um, positive results, though, again, we don't have a lot of data on what exact tests were done. So. We stopped enrollment during COVID, as you might imagine, during the peak of the pandemic. And we used that time to think about different ways to do this. Um, partly for what I mentioned, it was a little difficult to track longer term outcomes. And secondly, we're also in all of us enrollment site. And um, at the time when we started, all of us wasn't doing genomics, but then they were beginning to do genomics. And it seemed pointless to us to tell somebody they should enroll in the Alabama initiative when they could enroll in all of us and, and have their genome sequenced. So we worked with family medicine in three clinics, one in um, Birmingham, one in Hoover, which is a suburb, and one in Selma, which is in the heart of the poorest part of the state, and um, where there was a family medicine clinic that was interested in working with us. And in initially, we did not return pharmacogenetic data, though we did a background analysis of pharmacogenetic variants. But we didn't feel comfortable returning it because we didn't have contact with the primary care provider. So we weren't sure what people were going to do with that. But now, uh, as we integrated into family medicine, um, we have a team of pharmacists um, led by Nita Limdi um, who review the, the medication lists for all the participants and then the pharmacogenetic data that comes back. And then um, they would issue a patient facing report, which is pretty general and a physician-facing report, which is much more particular in terms of pharmacogenetic um, outcomes that might be actionable. And then that goes, unfortunately, right now as a PDF into the electronic health record. Well, this changed our demographics a lot now. Um, you can see the majority are Black or African-American, and that reflects the demographics of the clinics that we're working with. And um, so in that sense, we were happy. Still, there's a female predominance in terms of participation. But we wanted to get a sense of, um, you know, what, how do we um, work this so that it responds to needs of the community, something we hadn't done in the initial iteration and realized that we should have. And so we set up a community advisory board um, led by the people you see here, including Kelly, who um, is, I think, still in the room. And um, they then convene this board of um, 14 individuals. Um, you can see the, the breakdown in terms of gender and race and education here. Kind of on average, a pretty well-educated um, group of individuals. And uh, they had a number of meetings, um, and these were designed around particular issues that you can see listed here. Um, and the purpose was not to be a lecture on these things, but to get um, some background and then feedback from the, the group in terms of um, ways that we could be approaching this that would be sensitive to community needs. And a survey was done before those sessions had begun. It's called here pre-test. The test was the sessions. It's, I think, it maybe a bit of a misnomer. But anyway, the, they did a survey before that set of sessions. And then 10 of the 14 um, did a post-test, if you will, survey. And, and so I'll show you a little bit of data based on what came from that. So the first thing is um, that optimism towards genomic medicine in general actually slightly decreased after they participated in these sessions. And that, at first I thought, well, that doesn't make any sense. You know, we were you know, getting feedback from them and, and trying to get an understanding of what we were doing. And we've actually convinced them that this was less um, than they thought it might be. And actually, when you think about it, and it, think about the survey I showed you a while ago, it probably does make sense, which is that I think people are going into this, and at least in the demographics that we're looking at, 
with inflated expectations as to what it might accomplish and maybe have um, thought that they could learn more than they probably actually will learn um, from participation. And so a more realistic understanding of what can be accomplished is perhaps what was actually happening here. If you look, pre-test is in blue and post-test is um, in orange. Test, remember, means participation in these sessions. Um, there was not that much change in the assumption of um, how likely unnecessary medical tests would be. It actually went down in their mind um, after participation in the sessions. And um, there seemed to be somewhat of an increase in the degree to which individuals would have control over their health. Um, they concluded it wouldn't have been as well received by doctors as they originally thought it would be. Um, didn't change too much in terms of how well received it would be by patients. And these changes, the numbers are too small to do meaningful statistics. Um, uh, so they're really more trends than um, anything else. Just a few quotes um, from this um, barrier to testing. One person said they wouldn't take the test because they'd worry themselves to death because of it. And then the expected concerns about life insurance, wondering whether um, this would affect eligibility. Well, then the question was, what about the providers? And um, Larry Harold um, from the Implementation Science Group at UAB did a um, set of interviews and surveys with the um, primary care physicians to get a sense of um, how they viewed this. And looking at the climate of the clinic, how stressful things are, whether they're adequate resources and so forth, um, the, the most important thing turned out to be leadership engagement. And sure enough, that really ha is how this all started. Um, the reason we went to this group was um, somewhere along the way, the family medicine chair had come to me and said, if you ever have a genomic study that you think could be done in family medicine, please let me know. And well, we did. And um, so he was really strongly supportive of this. And we identified within the clinics, number of champions also who just were interested in, in participating and worked really hard with the um, clinic managers to set up the workflow so that it wouldn't be disruptive. We embedded people in the clinic to obtain informed consent and explain the study and genetic counselors continue to do the return of results, um, but they do notify the physician before the patient so that the physician isn't blindsided and oftentimes would give us information about the patient that would help in terms of uh, making sure that the information was received in a, in a constructive way. Their attitudes towards genomic testing, and I think these are technical terms used in implementation science, which I'll do, and I'm not really an expert on. Um, and you know, basically what they were pointing out here is that um, none of these were sort of home runs. This is a five point scale. So you can see that the attitudes are all sort of slightly positive, but not um, as strongly positive as you might have hoped. Um, the reinvention, I think, means the willingness to accept completely new ways of, of doing business, for example. Look at outcomes, um, acceptability, appropriateness, and so forth. Those were all, uh, again, modestly positive, not overwhelmingly so. Um, and just a couple of quotes um, in terms of helping patients take a more proactive approach. Um, I think the tool is underutilized, valuable to give insights to help patients take ownership of their health and be more preventative. Um, one interesting quote, a huge benefit is explaining to them how unique they are and the benefit of knowing. Uh, and we came into this figuring they wouldn't really have the time to do very much. And we tried to take as much of that off their plate as we could. Um, interesting to me to figure out the implications of changes in dosing and avoid certain medicines we would have, uh, that we would be able to do on the front end and get that information into a patient's I, chart, I think is what's missing there. Um, perceived patient reactions, it's been positive. I haven't had any negative reactions. When I do get results, it's like, oh, okay, this is super cool to know, but um, then there are people who um, are interested in and in say, what other things can we add to my health record? But One then on the other hand, patients that struggle with anxiety, I'm just about to the end here. So conclusions um, from this, um, from the public point of view, we found that there was wide public interest, um, but it's not so clear that it applies equally to all the um, demographics in the region. 
and expectations were not always realistic. And from the provider point of view, it's critical to have leadership engagement. It took a lot of support and the question of whether that's a sustainable model is, is certainly an important one. And it has to be integrated into the normal clinical workflow if it's gonna get acceptance. And I will end at that, thank you. I think we'll just go on to uh, the last talk and then we'll have a long discussion. Last talk is uh, Carol Horowitz, who I don't see on the screen yet. Carol will talk about APOL1 screening, opportunities, lessons learned, and evidence to support screening. All right. Hi, everybody. I dearly wish I was there to be learning and speaking with you all. Um, I, I miss especially the conversations we have between talks, so please reach out to me for any conversations you'd like to continue. Um, so it takes a village to do this kind of work. We're specifically now focusing on APOL1 screening and genomic equity. I'd like to call out two specific people, Danusha Mohatige, who helped me put this together, and I view as one of the futures of what we do, and Elder Mimsy Robinson, who is um, one of my most important mentors. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about, um, on behalf of us and a genomic stakeholder board that we've been working closely together for quite a few years now, about screening with an equity lens, the who's and how's. So first, the inequity. What we're talking about here when it comes to APOL1 um, is specifically looking at um, kidney disease inequity. And I'm hoping that in another 10 years, we won't continue to see these trends, but one data point speaks volumes, which is that while 13% of the US population is black, 35% of the US population on dialysis is black. Now, reasons for these, um, focus on, um, at this point, we are able to think about multiple determinants of health. Early on, um, and for, um, um, I assume some of you also had this unfortunate experience, of early on, um, people tended to think about disparities in a somewhat eugenic way with racial inferiority. Then people started thinking about patients. I would say, in general, a lot of the early discussions around patients, to me, seemed a little bit disparaging that or blaming that people had, uh, you know, people from certain groups had more disease because they were undereducated, fatalistic, not motivated, mistrustful. And then we started turning the lens in at ourselves and saying, wait a minute, we provide care to folks. What, it, what bias is baked in to the access and quality of care we deliver? And then as, you, as, as we know, we're here particularly now to talk about APOL1, um, we started looking at some genomic determinants and also social determinants. What's fascinating and important, I think, about looking at ABOL1 specifically as, um, as high-risk variants impacting chronic kidney disease is that it gets to this intersectionality that people are really starting to think very constructively about, which is that while race is a social construct, ancestry has some biology, and together they can make an impact on, um, on, on and influence equity. So I'm gonna share a, a little um, example of that below. Um, which is, um, and this is our genomic stakeholder board actually conceived of this study, the community partners conceived of it, um, as we were starting to understand that people with African ancestry, particularly from West Africa, had um, were exposed to sleeping sickness, um, developed APOL1 gene variants to protect themselves, but unfortunately, same gene variants seem to be kidney harming for many people. On the other hand, um, because of structural racism, um, black people are disproportionately exposed to air pollution, which is nephrotoxic. And what they asked us to do is see if there's any intersection between these. And here you can see in the blue that people who have APOL1 low risk, their risk of um, kidney failure, chronic kidney disease goes up as the amount of air pollution goes up. But in the maroon bar, you can see that if you're APOL1 high risk, there's clearly a gene environmental interaction and these two interact for like a, a two hit inflict to influence kidney disease. So getting back to APOL1, um, this hits, um, you know, this uh, Sentinel article from Terry Manolio and colleagues shows that it does fit that red box of something that is common and influences common disease. And that is really, really important. So the lifetime risk of end stage kidney disease is increased by up to tenfold if you have um, 
APO1 high risk variants, depending on what condition you come in with. But what's important here is it really does have a powerful relation to African ancestry because of the reason that people develop these APO1 gene variants. So it's found, these high risk variants are found in about one in seven people who self report black race or have African ancestry, but it's much less common in other groups. And I think it's important at this point to acknowledge how our field is growing in terms of acknowledging these perspectives on what happens when you're looking at this intersection between social determinants and genetics on disparities. When we first started this work, a genetic ethicist came up to me and said, do not touch this. You will set the disparities movement back 30 years. But I decided that if I wanted to do work, if I was gonna do research in this area, I would ask people in the community who are the ones who are disproportionately and unjustly impacted by inequities and chronic kidney disease. So my mentor on the right, Elder Mimsy, at a Caesar meeting, I think maybe even at the hotel you're at right now, um, when he first heard about APOL1 said, now maybe white doctors won't judge black people on dialysis as not caring enough or not being compliant they'll recognize that there's more to kidney disease than bad behavior. So who do we screen for APOL1 and what conditions? What, what do we think is ready for prime time now? And what kind of research do we need to do using APOL1 as an emblematic thing, but really we can think about this for other kinds of genomic screening as well. Well, first of all, somebody yesterday talked about pretest probability. And while this isn't exactly pretest probability, we do need to think about that while APOL1 is not a race gene, we need to figure out who we would screen for APOL1. Not only which health conditions they have, but here, what people's backgrounds are. So this map by um, Girish Nadkarni and colleagues shows that in some parts of the world, like in Europe, there's not a lot of APOL1, right? And you can see in the center in purple in West Africa where we think the gene variants be began, um, where it's very common. And um, you know, we need to soberingly look at the map to the right and show you know, the slave trade routes, you can see that APOL1 positivity follows them. So going to Salvador and Brazil and up the Caribbean and to North America. Um, and, and this reminds us that you wouldn't want to do mass screening of certain groups of people, but even in places like Africa, there are places where there's very low APOL1 and there are places that there are higher rates of APOL1. We use this in our work when we start engaging to see if people want to get able one um, screening to say, we think um, if you have any African ancestry, if you think you have African ancestry, if you consider yourself black or African-American. And we also do use things like this on the map to say there are people in certain parts of the world that look like they have higher risk of having high risk gene variants. Now the what, what target conditions should we be looking at? Um, so um, if you look at existing recommendations and the chart below, you can see in green, there are certain um, kidney diseases where if you have high risk variants, it increases your odds of having, the, having um, kidney problems greatly, like um, HIV associated nephropathy in Africa, the odds ratio of 89 times. And there are experts who are now coming out, nephrologists who are coming out and saying that you should be screening folks with these conditions um, to look at prognosis and for adherence there's a lot of work in kidney transplant. In the right circled in red, you can see there are certain places where it just doesn't make sense at this point to recommend screening for folks with in this. Um, one is at people with diabetes when it looks like there's not really an increased odds of, of causing kidney problems. And the other is folks that are older. We operationalize this by over 70. Some of the thought is if you've made it to that age without APOL1 causing problems, it may never cause you problems. The ones in orange are the ones I think we should spend a few minutes on because I think that's where a lot of the literature it, th where we need to do further research. That's looking at people with non-diabetic kidney disease, particularly people with hypertension and people with early kidney disease for other causes. So this, this figure shows some areas where we think that uh, we need more research. Um, and, and so starting out in terms of controlling high blood pressure, who should be screened among people who have high blood pressure? Does it make sense to screen everybody um, with African ancestry or consider themselves African-American um, or, or some Latin American folks? And because people, more than 50% of people with African ancestry and black people have hypertension, this is a really big group. 
I'm going to show you a little bit that there is some evidence that if you screen people and return high risk results to them, um, their blood pressure does come down short term. We need more research on long term. And there is some research that if you find people who have high risk APO invariance and aggressively control their blood pressure, it reduces mortality. In predicting um, CVD risk, cardiovascular disease risk, we know that population-wise, it is really um, we can see that you know that that people have these high risk variants and they're associated with kidney disease. What people are doing now, and this is a really important avenue for research, is how do we refine this for greater utility? So not everybody who has high risk gene variants is going to have kidney problems. So people are looking at gene 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 clinical and gene, and gene environmental interactions to try to refine this utility. And finally, we need a little bit more work in terms of preventing chronic kidney disease and chronic kidney disease progression. Can we find certain ways we should treat hypertension differently and treat early chronic kidney disease differently because someone has these high-risk variants? And also, what new therapies do we have to make this even more actionable? So as I said, I was gonna share a little bit about um, some of the work that we've done. Um, and our group um, did a primary care pragmatic trial where we randomized people um, to receive immediately or delayed receipt of their ApoE one risk variants. These are people who self-report African ancestry, um, who are adults in New York City. We had full community engagement, in fact, I would not have done this study unless Elder Mimsy and colleagues in the neighborhoods that we are studying said, we support you, we think you should do this also. And they helped with every single thing that we did. Um, we recruited over 2000 patients at 15 um, primary care, family medicine, academic community safety net sites in New York City. Um, what we did is we offered testing to folks. We had genetic counselors train staff that are from the community. Those staff recruited the folks and they returned the results. We offered everyone genetic counseling if they're interested, and then providers got best practice alerts in the electronic health records. What you can see here is when you take the people who were told they had high risk ApoE one variants versus people who were told they didn't, the people with high risk variants had significantly greater decrease in systolic blood pressure than the low risk or people who are controls. And there was also more chronic kidney disease screening and chronic kidney disease screening is very low and inappropriately low. The other thing I mentioned is that there is a study showing that intensive blood pressure control in people with ApoE one high-risk genotypes does confer survival benefit. You can see your strict blood pressure control in yellow and ApoE one positives versus usual blood pressure, how to survival advantage, and even strict blood pressure control in ApoE one positives versus um, strict blood pressure control in low-risk folks made a difference. So how best to screen? What do we do? Translation is a team venture. So what we, what we have developed here in New York City is what you call an accelerator model, where we say all these folks in, in the middle tend to be siloed, siloed ideas, questions, strategies. We bring them together as we did for the ApoE one studies. And this genomic board I talked about has now been involved in 15 other grants, millions of dollars of funding, and really some amazing breakthroughs. And we bring together patients and advocates, clinicians, researchers, funding, public health folks, industry, whoever we think will impact this problem. So together we can come up with new designs and processes. And the important part about this is bringing people in from the inception and calling people in, not saying clinicians won't do this or patients won't do this or industry is bad, but how do we all get together and say, what do we have in common? And answer for each group, why is this important for me? What do I do with the results? When we go out to clinicians with ApoE one they say, so if ApoE one's positive, what do you want me to do? We want you to do urine microalbumin testing. Okay, and if they're positive, we might want you to, we, we're gonna recommend you change medications. That I buy. Well, if they're already on those medications, I already screen them, what do you want me to do? Nothing. Okay, then don't take up hours of my time. Tell me what I need to do with the results. Be very practical. Same for patients. That's the first thing. The second thing is pilot every step of the way. Make sure you know what you're doing before you get out there. Again, what somebody said, the drip's not the fire hose to start. And really look at the assets. Look at every one of these people and recognize what they bring to the table and take the long view. 
So here's some possible research questions when we get to the steps. What are we doing? First of all, how do we select appropriate patients? As, we, as you saw on that map, who are the ones who are most likely to have high-risk gene variants? How do we select them? The next thing, and I hope the group can think about this. Maybe it's a non-starter. I don't really know. But are we going to consent every single patient for genetic testing forever? Or is there some point when it comes to APOA1 or pharmacogenomics or something where we're going to say we're going to treat it like another lab test? I don't know how that gets decided or who decides it, but I think that's important to think about. In terms of results, for clinicians, best practice alerts work for some, doesn't work for others. How do we continue to refine the ways we bring clinicians in so it doesn't take too much of their Here time? One minute. Thank you. Um, so we have to think about that. For patients, what is the role of genetic counselors? Do they need to be involved? And as I said before, we need to think about further treatments and how to benefit folks. In terms of new therapies, um, it's really important. Please remember there's a reason some things get funded more than others. You might wanna look at this article in New England Journal about cystic fibrosis affecting a third few Americans, primarily white than sickle cell, but receiving about 10 times the funding per patient. Finally, the last two things I want to say are um, remember that we need to improve CKD, that we need to improve CKD for everyone. It's not all genetic. And the last thing is be careful not being too paternalistic. We've heard they won't act. They'll be harmed. They don't believe us. You can see here when we asked clinicians of the patients who they thought would change behaviors, they said about a third most patients change behaviors. We asked clinicians if they thought patients would be concerned about insurance. Half of them said they would be. Our patients, even after receiving positive tests, were not that concerned. When we said who'd be worried, more than half clinicians said their patients would be worried, they weren't. So please remember to listen and learn from patients and the primary care providers. It's okay that people don't think genomics is as important as we all do. And my final thing I wanna say is that I've heard a lot today about people saying that patients don't trust us Clinicians don't believe us. Elder Mimsy would ask you all, who mistrusts who? And I wanna challenge us all, including me, to recognize that the people we're working with, the patients and clinicians we're working with, have a lot of genius and a lot to offer us. Thank you. Okay, so thank you, Carol. and. Uh... Now is the time for discussion. Uh, I'm going to take the prerogative of the chair and ask my friend Carol to help me and Dan potentially see anyone down here that has their card up. So the same uh, mechanism, please turn your card on its side and uh, we'll be happy to call on you. Josh, Josh. Oh, Josh Peterson. Uh, this is a question for Carol. Carol, that was a really nice summary of the situation with APOL1. Um, so if, I, I guess if you were to think about adding APOL1 to a general population screening panel, um, what would be the barriers in your view of just having that be part of the panel regardless of the uh, reported ancestry or, or self-reported race of the individual? Um, I think, as I said, consent is one of the things. Remember, you know, we as clinicians, when we order tests, we order tests. We don't get consents to do a creatinine or for a lot of the other tests we do. So I think it's the entire process. I think it's the first thing is um, how do we order the test? I think it can be pretty simply done. April one is easier than a lot of the other tests that folks do. Um, it's, it's getting the consent. It's getting easy to understand information with patients, which I think we've done a lot of work, qualitative and quantitative. And I think we've gotten the patient, the patient thing down to very, very, very brief. And I think it could be graphic. And the final thing is continuing to make sure that the way we return the results to providers uses the best practice alerts like the ones, Josh, we've been using in, in, in the Guard US study so that things are very easily actionable. And of course, payers. Okay. Rex? And then, um, Jeff and Jessica. Kay, okay. I, I'm just no, a little confused. Rex but, is next. Oh, sorry. So, I, thinking about this as a um, evidence needed to support screening, I think the presentations all gave pretty good evidence that there's evidence to support screening. Um, 
So I think that begs the question then, what screening and when? And I thought, uh, you know, Dave's presentation made a pretty compelling case that earlier the better. But I think uh, some of the other presentations made the case that don't overscreen. But yet I'm thinking about yesterday, several people during the day yesterday uh, kept, and, and I've thought about this a lot, kept pushing us back in the direction of, well, when do we start, and I think Heidi was one of them, when do we start thinking about doing this at births? That's the earliest you can do, where you can actually intervene on the widest range of things. And the other thing that I wanted to just factor into this, and then I want to hear people's thoughts about this, is you know the discussion that Dave had about um, sort of the value of PRS screening versus the value of single gene screening. And of course, the ultimate PRS screening is a genome sequence. So I, I'm just interested in the context of all of those factors that we've heard about just in the last hour. What about people, what, you know, what evidence do we need to think about going to screening at birth, or is that still just a crazy idea? Well, I'll, I'll take a stab at it. Um, I think there's a couple of factors to uh, weigh in uh, or to consider. One is uh, what, um, there's a pragmatic aspect that was uh, alluded to yesterday in terms of screening at birth, which is it's the one time where we sort of capture everybody. And so if we're going to generate a sequence, um, <clears throat> that's probably the time to do it. Now, I don't think we should conflate getting a sequence at birth and screening at birth because there's lots of different things that you can do with the sequence uh, if you were to generate that. Um, there's a lot of things you shouldn't be doing at birth with the sequence, but there would certainly be a defined number of uh, conditions that would be appropriate to screen for at birth that you know coincides at least in some way, shape, or form with our current newborn screening panel, uh, but I don't think we should also assume that it's going to replace analyte screening, as I frequently say, no one's going to sit in an office looking at variants in phenylalanine hydroxylase and trying to infer what the uh, uh, phenylalanine level in the blood is. You're going to just measure it. Uh, so I think that, that um, uh, how we do that remains to be seen. But I think having that sequence as a reference that follows the patient then allows for the opportunity to use that for indication-based testing as people develop problems. So if they have developmental delay or if they develop seizures or things of that nature, you can use that sequence and reuse that sequence for a variety of different purposes over a person's lifetime. And then at certain points in that lifetime, it would be appropriate to apply a screening paradigm. Uh, so whether it would be um, carrier screening when somebody reaches uh, reproductive age or whether we're talking about population screening for uh, disease risk, as we've been talking about today. So it's the dynamic and multifaceted use of sequence that would be captured at birth that I, at least is the way I think about it. I'll, I'll just weigh in with the counter argument. Um, and, and that is, you know, yes, a, a genome can be used in that way. I can completely agree that's a possibility. And, and probably at some point our genome sequencing technology will get to the point where the incremental improvements year over year are are, are over, right? And then you have a complete genome that is stable that you will reanalyze for 20 years. I don't know who's reanalyzing uh, a 10 year old genome at this point. Probably no one. You're going to get a new one, right? If you're okay, but let's let, you're you're, you're going to reanalyze it as a as a opportunistic thing. But if you need to go back and do another diagnostic on somebody, you're probably going to upgrade to a new technology that's going to catch, right? all the variants you need. So I guess my, my central argument about the sort of should we do it all at birth or should we um, think about other op opportunities for screening is that there's lots of conditions that you will want to screen for at different time points. And I think in terms of um, operationalizing that, the barriers to getting the whole genome at birth that gets reanalyzed and follows people over lifespan, I think is an, an enormous amount of barrier to achieve, whereas <clears throat> building out um, really well-designed targeted panels right now for um, screening at different age and time points is fully feasible and can be done um, and, and probably pretty cost-effectively um, so that a an addition to the newborn screen with a 
10, 20, 30, 40 conditions that you check for by newborns by next generation sequencing um, could clearly augment what we're currently getting. And then we can think about offering that type of screening to people throughout their lifespan for conditions that are relevant. I think APOL1 is a really good target for childhood screening, right? You need to know about it in childhood so that you can prevent the glomerular, you know, glomerular disease from developing if there's an intervention for it. So um, I do think we should be thinking about that, but also kind of when is the most appropriate time to be looking for things. I just add one thing, and, and it would be an interesting debate between Jonathan and I since we have fairly disparate ideas about how to do this. But I think the other thing that we're missing our opportunity on is that we are doing millions of sequences, and we throw them away. Where we do have an indication to do a sequence, and we do it, and we throw it away. We treat it like a sodium. And that's ridiculous, and it's wasteful. And so we should also be thinking about the idea that if there's a reason to generate a sequence for whatever reason, we retain that data and we use it. Because while I can't argue against the idea that at some point we'll have better sequences, the reality is, um, is that we've got a ton of information in those sequences that can be used today and tomorrow and the next day and probably for the next five to 10 years. And yet we just toss it away. Uh, folks, this is pretty sad. Um, just want to make a point. First of all, we're, we're part of a study of doing newborn sequencing. Um, this is the BBC2 project. Some of you are familiar with the BBC, original BBC project, which tried to um, consent parents um, with newborns. And I think they had challenges in, in getting them to agree to participate in the study because healthy newborn um, parents of healthy newborns had their mind on other things than enrolling their new child in the study. But now uh, we're recruiting in the first year of life. And um, I'd say there are challenges there too, but it is moving forward. And there's a long list of things that will be returned and a lot of outcome measures that are built into this. So it'll be a while before it has reached a point where there's actual data to show, but there is a, an ongoing study. You know, that all said, I, I think the notion of reusing the genome and, you know, I take Jonathan's point that there's, you know, the technology keeps changing. Maybe it'll someday be cheaper to redo it than to bother storing it anywhere. But um, even if it were the case that you would want to reanalyze the genome, we have to grapple with the fact that individuals are unlikely to live out their entire life connected to the original health system that sequenced that genome, if that's where it was done. Um, and so, you know, if you had your sequencing done as a newborn, let's say, uh, where is it going to live that it's going to be accessible to the clinician years and years later, assuming it's still readable in its state of the art at that time? And, you know, in a kind of a integrated health system, maybe that works in our not integrated um, health system, if you can call it that, um, it could be a real challenge and it may open up opportunities for ways of putting information in places that will be accessible. People are willing to trust banks with what may be among the most sensitive information they have, which is their financial situation. And are there um, circumstances where, you know, banks of some sort could be um, put into place that would store the genomic information for future use? So I, so we have lots of people who want to say something. So, um, and I, I mean, I'm not sure who, sorry? Oh. I think Kate was, oh, well, so, first of all. So Peter, Kate, uh, and, and Carol's pointing to two people on this side. I, and I had my thing up before Dave, but he can go, he can go before me, it's okay. I, so. Jessica's has been up for quite a while. So Jessica, yeah. Jessica Kate, Peter, Heidi. Heidi. And then we'll go and we'll go from there. Jessica, you're on. Well, first I have a comment and I have a question. Uh, just to um, bounce off of what Bruce just said, coming from an integrated healthcare system, it's still hard to track people. <laughs> so even in that environment, keeping track of someone, they move out of that healthcare system and they're gone. You're not going to find them again. Um, 
so that's that's my concern about that approach of kind of following someone over time is where does it live and 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 how do you actually use it to help them um, my question though is for Dave to come back to your cost effectiveness is is there a factor that you see in this entire process that's the heavy hitter of improving cost effectiveness is it the uptake is it the follow-up care is it the cascade testing that we could focus on to really improve the cost effectiveness um, I'm not worried about improving it I'm, I, I, I guess like I, I, I'm putting my evidence-based medicine hat on that Ned forced down over my head many years ago, <laughs> thinking about the U.S. Preventative Services Task Force and that incredibly high bar, et cetera, et cetera. There's clinical benefit. Right? The costs are not a huge issue from my perspective. It, it's potential harm, and I think Ned mentioned that yesterday. Um, I think that's the thing where there's the uncertainty. What's going to prevent a uh, large organization or recommendation body from saying, hey, why, why would we not do this? And I think it's concern about potential harms. And I think it's the false reassurance is my short answer to your question. It's reducing the uncertainty about potential harm. I, to me, that's like the last major piece that, that, that really um, is a potential concern. All those other things that you could do that you talked about, uh, uptake, access to care, those are all very important. Um, but at this point, I feel like it's maybe a bit more of a risk benefit um, assessment, safety concern. And I don't know, Ned, if you have any. No. So, Kate. Yeah. So I um I I was going to make a few comments. So one is I completely agree with Jonathan and uh, Bruce about the like our healthcare like first of all the genome keeps changing. Sec, you know the technology keeps changing. There's no way it's going to be reanalyzed and move on. I, I was a little mystified by this discussion about consent. Um, I, I want to point out that we don't really consent people for clinical testing as it is. We sort of talk to them about it, but there's no actual consent process. And I also want to like bring this back to sort of the real world of what's actually happening out there. So like, I think we sit and I have this in my own institution, like the genetics people have this whole sort of cognitive discussion about this. But I can tell you my nephrologists in the clinic next year are ordering 450 gene panels willy nilly with no consent process, nothing about genetic testing and nothing what's happened. I was doing chart reviews for a project and like I literally, people were like sending messages through the portal saying, I would like to be tested for this. Someone is saying, oh, I ordered this genetic test for you and here's your genetic test, go to your local lab or in Quest. So I, I just wanna like, you know, like as much as we wanna cogitate about like how genetic testing is happening and how we're doing it in the genetics clinic and we're doing the right thing about consenting this, that, and the other. I can tell you that's not what's happening there. And I think out in the real world, and I think we need to think about what are the minimal standards that we think people should be imparting to people about genetic testing and how do we get the word out there and how do we educate people to say, you've got to tell them something other than just ordering their test when they ask through it through the patient portal. Um, and and so I just like, I, I agree that we have to do something, but I think sort of having a lot of discussion about consenting and not consenting is not consistent with what's actually happening when you look around in the real world. And I, I just want to say that, sorry. I, I, I'm going to just stick in a comment on that. I want to ask you a question or a follow-up question is that is, um, what happens when the results of the genetic test are in fact uh, find find a pathogenic variant. Uh, is do, are those people uh, referred back to the person who ordered the test, or or is there a follow up mechanism? So we what we find in our clinic is that people, lots of cardiologists order lots of testing and then they have no idea what to do with it. Patients have not been warned that they might have a VUS and then, and then they all go nuts. And so is there a mechanism at your place that prevents that right. scenario? Well, so uh, Dan, good question. That's exactly what I, I'm actually have this new center for 
Penn Center for Genome. That's exactly the question that we're sort of working on because um, I agree with you. Like that information is not being uh, being disseminated. And worse than what you just said, um, I had another conversation with one of our neurologists who said, well, the neurology residents are all ordering all these tests and they're getting all these VUS. So he's doing muscle biopsies on all these people with VUSs to sort out the VUS problem because now they've had, I, I'm just saying like, you're like, okay, like, that's worse. Like, you know, at least you're not getting a muscle biopsy out of the situation. So I'm just saying, like, I think we need to think about, like, what we talk about versus what's actually happening when we go and look around our institutions and how we should be thinking about those types of issues, Dan. And it sounds like you and I have had exactly the sort of the same conversations. I was just going to say in response to Kate, if I could just add that, there, you know, there is a patchwork of laws, state laws that uh, that influence this. So your experience in Philadelphia is, I think, different than New York and uh, Massachusetts, where I, I've been. Um, maybe there's a multi-center study. I, I would also say that no one, uh, the physicians who are ordering the testing don't know what the state laws are. So that you're assuming that they have an understanding of those state laws. And I would suggest to you they have no idea what the laws are. So in New Jersey, you're not supposed to do this. I, I can tell you, I don't think they know what the laws are. It might depend on how strict the law is. Genetic testing is so broad. I think part of it is it, it might be up to this community to determine if there are tiered approaches to it. So it might be that something like pharmacogenomic testing has a lower bar and you don't need to have as much of a consent discussion. And maybe that's like assessing an allergy or a doing a creatinine. But when you have other things that could lead to needs for biopsies or, uh, or life altering surgeries. So I, I think we have to start thinking about the nuances of this and how we, how we divide up and it might not be a one size fits all. And I, I, I do really support really more work to try to understand this better. Uh, so just a, a couple of comments, one back to Rex's uh, question around timing. I, I agree right now that the genome and the trackability of patients is in a state that I just don't think it's feasible to run once and think you're going to really make use of that data. So I think you have to really focus on the point in time you screen and what you can do right then in terms of the sort of cost and utility models. The problem with newborn screening is there's an assumption that you will then look for newborn things at the same time you might be looking for adult. And that means you have to do it rapidly because the intervention for dietary change and things like that is, is going to be critical. And the cost goes way up when you have to do a rapid interpretation and analysis. And so I, you know, right now they're charging over $14,000 for a rapid NICU, you know, uh, genomic analysis. So I think another consideration is the prenatal period, uh, because now you have nine months of a framework to think about your results and what they mean. Um, uh, so, so it's another consideration of a time point to think about screening, which although also has some urgency to it, which is why I don't think carrier screening should be effectively done in the prenatal period where two thirds of it is being done today. At the same time, it's probably in some ways better for the newborn aspect. So just one thing to, to think about in terms of the timing question. Um, the other thing around the consent that, that Kate brought up, it, it is, I, I do agree with Mike, it's, it varies by state and in Massachusetts is in great, extremely strict laws around that consent process, but that led us to come up with a very focused consent form and implementation of a policy and ease of electronic consent in Mass General Brigham's system so that every genetic test order would go through the same process and be supportive. So I, I do think that that is something that would be a, a good thing to focus on is coming up with that minimum standard so that this process isn't you know a 10-page consent form that takes forever and we can really hone in on the critical elements of that consent so it can be universal and sort of standardized uh, and include things like data sharing, which are critical for our field. Hi. Hi, thank you. Um, I have a question for Bruce. Uh, I think you mentioned um, that your program that you presented on was state-funded um, by your state of Alabama. I wonder how you built the momentum 
um, to approach the state and, and get them to, um, to support this effort. Um, so this came about, I guess, at a point in time when, um, you know, Hudson Alpha was fairly new, and um, I think there was a lot of interest in um, the state supporting genomics in general, and um, the, basically the the state legislative liaisons between UAB and Hudson Alpha, I think, worked together to, um, you know, show this as an example of how the two institutions could collaborate and do something that would, um, you know, help the citizens of the state and and these two institutions, which the state was, I think, really supportive of and interested in in um, bringing visibility to. So, um, I was asked to write a um, kind of a short description. This was the the um, kind of shortest proposal I've written for the largest amount of money, maybe over time. Um, but, you know, this went through a legislative sort of process. I don't think there was a law written or anything, but it was just an allocation uh, that um, I think reflected the trust and the kind of um, esteem that the two institutions um, were held in in the state. So uh, it turned out, although I don't know what really went on behind the scenes, but from my point of view, it was something that they've embraced. And now we're into seven years, I think, since this started, and we get money each year. So probably the most I can tell you. Congratulations. Okay. I've often thought about how to approach um, the state that I'm living in, which is Texas, but uh, because I think it's a, 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 you know, an area with a lot of diversity, big population, um, and I think that you know, this would be, you know, something very important for the state. Um, I have one other um, point I wanted to make. It had it not to do with the previous question, but the time to screen. Um, I wonder if um, the thoughts about screening at around 18 years of age, I think, you know, there's a lot of um, um, concern about screening of newborns without their consent, obviously, and then using this information as they are into adulthood. So perhaps at 18, um, at the time of driver's license or registering to vote, um, uh, that this could be something that could be used then for the adults with their consent. Um, and as we've mentioned um, many times, screening earlier seems to have better outcomes. It's an interesting uh, concept in the, the sense that uh, um, it, it makes a lot of sense for the reasons you put forward, but it's also the time as a pediatrician, I can reflect that it's about the lowest interaction with the healthcare system that you can have. But the idea of using a model that would be outside a public health program that would be outside of the healthcare system model, I think is really an intriguing thing to explore. Peter has been waiting longer than anybody else. So. Thanks. Um, I have a couple of comments based on Dave's presentation and the subsequent um, conversation. And then I had a question for Carol. Um, so uh, first, um, Dave, as you mentioned, I think if you've seen one genetic screening program, you've seen one genetic screening program. And I think that goes a little bit to this question of uh, overdiagnosis. So in the model that you ran, if I remember correctly, you looked at prophylactic surgery for HBOC didn't include sort of increased screening, starting treating in earlier ages. So if the intervention was start getting screened in your 20s, you might start to see the offsets of overdiagnosis in, in earlier ages. Um, so that might sort of offset things a little bit. So getting to the when to start screening, it's uh, earlier is not necessarily always better, depending on what the intervention is. Um, uh, the second point is it's a nice framework for um, exploring areas of uncertainty. So again, if there is some uncertainty around what the penetrance is, you can always like run simulations like what if we're off by a factor of X or Y. Uh, and it may actually still, even if you have that uncertainty, it may still make sense in a, in a reasonable range. Um, uh, and then uh, finally, I don't want to necessarily underscore your general comments on polygenic risk score. Um, but I do want to emphasize that it's still worth exploring. Um, so the CISNET group did a cost effectiveness um, uh, analysis of polygenic screening for breast cancer, um, found that it was cost effective, um, but under a scenario where there was a very detailed sort of schedule of, uh, you know, what the, what the recommendations are. So there are like five tranches. And if you're in the lowest tranche, you can start screening later and only come back every three years. 
So in principle, you could find something that sort of you know hit the sweet spot that was cost effective. Um, but going back to my comments yesterday, is then that gets really complicated to sort of implement. So there there might be a trade off there. Um, so I I do have a question for Carol, but if you want to. I just say I'm not. I didn't mean to be super negative on PRS. I'm just saying it's, it's a very different world. But yep. I think if you can combine con, combine and cross conditions, that's you'll get some value there. But you got it can't be too complicated. To your right. point, yeah. So. Um, and then um, so Carol, yesterday um, April um, uh, talked about um, carrier screening and how uh, there were some missed opportunities if you sort of recommended carrier screening only from, for people from certain groups. Um, uh, but you were suggesting that the, 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 the value here is, is focusing on people of particular ancestry. Um, so I guess I'm wondering how you see that being operationalized. Is it based on people's self-reported ancestry, race, ethnicity, or are you looking sort of at genetic ancestry that might be derived from, from sequencing or GWAS data? I mean, you know, it, it it, it seems my understanding of the the literature is that the, is that you pick up somewhat similar people, some different, but I don't think that we're gonna we're gonna characterize people's genetic ancestry and then offer testing. That seems, while it's it's careful, it's it's not very practical. So I think the only thing we can go by is how people self-report their race and their ancestry, and I would say that. Um, we, we do need to be careful about it. That's why we need to have people from diverse communities at the table, rep, you know, representing advocate communities to make sure that we're doing the right thing. And I would say in New York City, when we proposed this to people and we went out and said, you know, how do you feel about us offering this just to this population? There were some clinicians that were worried. Our patient and advocate communities weren't as worried. And one thing we heard again and again is, this is one of the first times we have seen that we will be among the first, not the last, to benefit from advances in science. So I, I think it's who we have at the table and how we frame the conversation that will make us successful. Folks, I'm going to need to sign off now. I actually have to give a talk at another meeting, and apparently I'm being introduced right now. So, um, But if there are questions for me, just um, you can put them in the chat or um, let, let me know by email, and I'll try to answer them. Sorry, I have to duck out thanks. right now. Thanks. Thanks for participating. Bob, I think is next. Yeah, um, one one comment about um, Heidi's suggestion of prenatal screening, which is in some ways really interesting because of the timing issue, but it adds uh, the huge complication of what some people in the prenatal screening business call, call the intolerome, the variants that are incompatible with life and are the, where the fetus is going to be miscarried, um, so so it's it's it opens a significant can of worms. Um, my question was for Bruce. I think um, could you talk about the the not not this? Um, could you talk about the data evidence gaps or data gaps necessary to generate qualities for some of these possible diseases? Yeah, for Dave. Sorry. Um, it's my impression is that qualities have a lot of data inputs, and some of them have to be very crudely estimated. And could you say some something about that? Yeah, I don't. I don't want to go down too much of a rabbit hole. We have entire conferences on this quality metric. Uh, again, it's a quality adjusted life here. You do all these probabilities to project out how, how much disease you prevent and how many. Uh, years of life you save. That's the main thing the model does. And then the quality is really just saying, are you also affecting people's quality of life? And so you have to come up with an estimate for, um, say, what's your quality of life once you have uh, metastatic breast cancer? Okay, it's, not, it's not as good as if you're totally healthy. So you do that usually through some type of survey research uh, type approaches uh, with patients or the general population. So that's a general approach. There, there, it, there's kind of uncertainty in measuring them. Um, I'm, that stuff doesn't, frankly, worry me a ton because the important point is to capture it to some extent. There's other issues with quality metric that you, if you extend someone's life who um, doesn't have great quality of life, that can actually be discriminatory against them. So there's all kinds of, of more detailed layers of issues with it. I think the field is generally 
um, uses it because it captures the two things that we manufacture in healthcare, more life and better life in terms of health. Um, but it's not the be all and end all, and there's other, other metrics that you can use, and there, there is uncertainty with it. Um, actually, you know, my, my, my thing was up before yours, I think. So I have a question for Carol, and, and maybe I just misunderstood, but the, the, the presentation you know, made a com very compelling story that ApoL1 is an important determinant of chronic kidney disease in African Americans. So why not screen all African Americans for ApoL1 variants before they get kidney disease? Because the, the, the slide you had was that you have to screen people have, who have uh, lupus nephritis and people with preeclampsia and, and, and not people with diabetes. Why not, why not just screen everybody? It's a really good question. Um, I, I think the challenge is that um, there are certain places where the um, odds of having kidney disease, if you're able and positive, go way up, and certain ones there doesn't seem to be an association. So right now, as far as we know, if you have diabetes, it doesn't seem like um, having high risk ApoL1 variants increases your risk of kidney disease, where it does for other things. So it gets to the idea of um, what does it mean to somebody if you're telling them they have a high risk variant when they have no underlying condition that actually means that they could end up getting kidney disease, um, is it worth? And and it also gets the idea of inflicted insight, right? You know, kind of an ethical thing. Are you just telling somebody something bad might happen, even if it might not happen? So I think we do need more research in there. But as far as I know, there's not a lot of ABLE one experts, and I'm not an ABLE one genetic expert. I'm an equity researcher who are saying that we should be doing um, ABLE one testing for everyone. However, there are communities, um, patient communities, University of Washington and others who have, have done a lot of work bringing um, folks and communities together where patients are saying, um, we would like to know and why can't we know? And then it's gonna get to who's gonna pay for it and what is the actionability? So if somebody has hypertension screening from ApoL1 make, make a lot of sense that they have diabetes and normal kidney function, People might be curious about it, but do we think that's a medically necessary thing where people are going to do something that's going to help them? We don't have that data yet. We can debate that forever, I guess. Jillian. Uh, I wanted to go back to Jessica's question for Dave and a little bit of where I think Peter was going to um, was in thinking about sort of the, the post-testing interventions for folks who are identified to be high risk and how much that impacts the models that we have and the degree to which we should be investing in um, research to find the right follow-up models that will, will both improve the cost of effectiveness, be better for patients, um, be potentially more affordable, um, because mammograms are not great tests. And so tests that tell you to get mammograms like are just adding uncertainty in some ways. Um, and there are other tests we have that, that may not be great. And so it seems like that may be a real um, opportunity. And then a highly specific question that may or may not be related to that is that the difference in qualities in your data between um, BRCA1 and 2 and Lynch syndrome, um, what was really driving that, that difference and that dollar amount between those two and the 30-year-old age group? Okay. Um, I, I, I'm thinking, you know, I, I don't know that I actually directly I answered Jessica's question as well as I could have, so thanks for bringing it back up. It, yeah, I think making sure that people and Providers and patients hear what the recommendations are and making sure there's good uptake and what's the mechanism? Is this you know, genetic counselor? Is it? So I think that's an area that's ripe for research is, is helping people understand the recommendations and making sure there's good uptake. So I think that that's a, a huge area for improvement. Does that, that answer that component? You're kind of squinting. I think I'm less worried about uptake, but more that the, the guidelines we may be giving aren't, aren't that great right now. Or do we know that, you know, yeah, the, the screening recommendations question. that are we these, have are these for high-risk folks. Are like, these interventions in these specific patient populations proven? And I think you could debate, have some debate about it. There's, there's, there's okay data that more frequent colonoscopies and people with Lynch syndrome reduces the risk. It's not great. It's not great data. Um, but I, but I also think there's um, at a certain point, you know, are you going to invest a bunch of money in a big randomized control trial like that, or are you going to spend your money? Um, improving communication and other things like that. Um, let me try to get at your other question, which was, um, it looked like HBOC provided more 
as much or more clean or was more quite cost effective than like Lynch and um, the short answer is that the surgical interventions for HBOC are so effective. That's probably the main driver. Some other other things come into play like prevalence and uptake and adherence, but that's a those are those, particularly ovarian, very high risk, very bad outcomes, very effective intervention. And even though not all women pursue it, um, has big, it ends up having big effects. Josh might want to say something since he might remember our analysis better. I was just going to mention that the other thing to think about is what is the standard screening approach. And so with colorectal cancer screening, we have a very effective uh, screening modality with, with colonoscopy. And so it's the incremental change that will sometimes drive the model as opposed to um, you know, exactly what you're doing. I think the other piece that, um, Jillian, you were getting at was the idea that, you know, right now we're comparing it against uh, the standard population-based screening recommendations. But what Peter was introducing is the idea that we could potentially do better at risk stratifying and maybe there are people that we could, you know, put into a less intense screening um, uh, uh, approach which would have uh, cost implications that um, uh, could uh, potentially improve the cost effectiveness of the model because you're avoiding uh, that. But the, the challenge, of course, with that is that we don't do this in a vacuum. And the, as we've seen with, um, you know, the debate over do we do initiate uh, routine mammography at age 50 or age 40, uh, the battle of, well, we're missing people between the ages of 40 or 50 that have breast cancer. Um, um, and that drives more work, uh, more prevent, uh, more interventions than the idea that, well, okay, there's more harms associated with doing it at a younger age as well. So we don't treat those cognitively the same. And so I think there's, um, a really interesting question to be addressed that if we do put people into lower risk categories, will they in fact, uh, prefer to adhere to population-based recommendations or will they decrease their frequency? For colonoscopy, I can virtually guarantee you they'll decrease their frequency colonoscopy, but for other things, maybe not so much. Can I make a quick follow-up on that? I, I think we often forget that given re reasonable assurances of sort of health and safety, most people would rather not be in the healthcare system, right? <laughs> Great, thanks. Um, David, I wanted to ask you about your, your modeling of polygenic risk scores. Obviously, there's a continuum of risk when you estimate polygenic risk. And um, one way to, to think about screening using PGS is, is, or PRS it would be to just pick the very tippy top of risk for a given condition, but do many, many conditions, in, in which case you probably would get a bunch of people. It seems to me that's not all that different from screening for a monogenic condition and should be cost-effective, but I was wondering what threshold you used when you did your modeling. Um, the short answer is yes. I, I think that's, I think, I think that's how you're going to get there with PR, so it, being careful with those thresholds, picking them out uh, kind of one by one, depending on the condition and combining. Uh, what I showed you was more of a cartoon, so our intensive modeling work, we're just getting started on it, um, okay. but that's one of our goal. One of our key goals is using these methods to identify um, the impact of using different thresholds oh, because great. I think that's that's really where you get your efficiency, right, is, mm -hmm. is, is what you're pointing out. And um, so I think there's really a lot of promise uh, in that regard. Great. And I, and I think another advantage of that is you probably diminish false positives the higher up you go on the risk threshold. And, and that's why with, with Emerge, we tried to stick with the 2% and people kind of stretched it because yeah. the budget was there, which is not a good reason to do that. No, but no. at any rate, um, no, that's great. It'd be great to see that modeling. So my, my, question, my question goes off on the different direction and Peter's might be, your mic. You might be more related to what this current track. Yeah, just to really quick to underscore what Julian's point and some of the subsequent points is the evaluation of these will change depending on what the intervention is. And interventions are changing. So something that may not make sense now, like population BRCA1 screening for pancreatic cancer, you know, there's not a great screening test. It's invasive. It's not very sensitive. Uh, but, you know, touch wood, in 10 years, if there is something that is... Uh, uh, 
cheap and uh, not invasive and very sensitive and is really downstaging pancreatic cancer, then maybe screening makes sense. So, yeah, and improved clinical treatment for breast cancer makes the clinical benefit of screening lower. <laughs> There's the cost issue, which pushes it in an so opposite makes it, makes direction. It lower? So, yeah, I mean, if breast cancer isn't as fatal because there's great treatments, then screening isn't as clinically beneficial, but there's a cost piece there that's big. So it gets complicated, but yeah, um, we, we stumbled into that those issues a little bit in all of our modeling, kind of what's the standard of care and the evidence is coming from an era of uh, different standards. And so it, it gets pretty pretty complicated. I, I might just know we have four minutes left in this yep. session. Yep, yep, I was gonna say that. Oh. <laughs> Carol. I'll try to not take up all four minutes. So my question was actually for Carol. I was really uh, interested in one of your last slides where you compared what kind of physicians expected versus what the patients actually did, the percentage differences. And I wonder if you think that's due to the way the patients were engaged in your particular model and if that if there's been comparisons of different engagement models and the responses that, that patients give or the actions that they might take um, following genetic testing? Um, it's a good question. You know, we used an engagement model to build the study itself. That engagement model informed how the patients were approached for the study and became part of the study. You know, the, we had a less than an 8% refusal rate, so I don't think it's a cherry-picked patient population. So I think the patients are probably representative of the general population in, in the New York City area anyhow. Um, but I think um, the, you know, this was a very simple one. When, when clinicians came into the study, we asked each of them, what do you, how do you think your patients will respond to this? And this is what they said. Patients had a, a brief encounter, maybe a half hour or so, with a, with a clinical research coordinator then they got the test results back in a somewhat brief conversation. They were not involved in the bigger engagement model. And as part of the follow-up survey, we just asked them how they felt about the test that they had. So I don't, I'm not sure the engagement model really influenced them that much. They might've been more comfortable with it because the people returning results to them were from their community um, and were similar to them, that's possible. But it still is striking to me and I know for me, look, when I came in this as a researcher, I came with a null hypothesis. I had no idea if patients were going to be traumatized for this or not care, if they would be excited about it, if they'd be interested in the study. So this to me was really interesting data that the patients were saying in general, they weren't as upset as we thought they were, um, and, and that they liked the way that the participation went. So I don't think it's, I don't think it's, um, it's what you were saying, although it's interesting, but I do think more research needs to be done because New York is New York, right? <laughs> I could ask Ned and David to uh, debate about adding things to tier one. You made the comment yesterday that tier one was there 15 years ago, then you left the field and you came back and it's still three conditions. And, and I, I sense some frustration in that. And, and Dave's argument was leave tier one alone because it's, uh, it's a great model and, and we should sort of, there, there aren't other models. So is there, uh, what's the way forward to, to expand this in a rational way without sort of, I mean, is the next step the ACMG 59 or is the next step to add TTR in people of African-American origin or, or, or is, is there another rational next step? Yeah, I was trying to think about this yesterday and again, compelled by the two first talks that the it, it's possible for us to understand the evidence gaps that keeps, that has prevented more conditions from being added to tier one. Um, and so I would reverse engineer it and say, okay, where are the gaps? You know, what's close? What do I call it? Almost ready for prime time? And how can we fill those gaps in? That would be one approach to saying, okay, we meet the, I mean, the, the, the criteria for getting to tier one are the same. So one way is to get more tests to meet that criteria. The other one is to think more in the provisional space or the study space. So if you're not ready for prime time, let's not mess with tier one. <laughs> it would be good since we have tier one to implement it. It's, 
one of the things that makes me seized is the number of, you know, A and B recommendations from the U.S. Preventive Services Task Force that we just don't implement. And we don't implement them well, and we don't implement them for everyone. So you have three tests. Let's at least get those implemented because we believe there's both public health and individual health benefit in doing so. So that's one issue. But thinking about adding to it is, could you put in provisional studies? Could um, NHRGI think about, you know, who could do this in a closed system or in a system where there are enough controls where we can add to the evidence base to get things over the hump or into tier one? So that would be my approach. The last one. Um, and then we're going to break. Yeah, no, I, I agree with Ned. Uh, the, only, the only other thoughts I've had is, I'm not saying don't add stuff, just saying don't mess it up. And it's really thinking of more of, a, okay, we're there clinically, we're maybe good there economically, we're maybe good there in terms of implementation. I'd like to see this, it's being done now. Um, we're, we saw in the all of us, so more of a risk-based approach is like, if you're gonna add something to it, what's the risk um, of, of modifying the, the clinical benefit or the economic value, et cetera? So just kind of more risk-based approach to adding things rather than, oh, it has to meet this bar. And I think the answer is somewhere in between those two. And I think that uh, based on prevalence being the driver and, and uh, that if we were gonna look for an evidentiary gap, uh, C282Y and hemochromatosis is the next obvious one in my mind. In my mind. Well, the, the other thing is hypertrophic. Mark had to get the last word. Seasons. I mean, I, you know, it's, uh, I said Dave was gonna have the last word. <laughs> and, and you know, yeah. Can I have the last word? Hypertrophic cardiomyopathy is now on the CDC site. I think that's uh, next up. The heart, failure the heart failure person who gets transplanted that Bruce said and, and had no idea that that was all genetic. That's, that's a tragedy. We're gonna break. Thanks to all of our speakers for a great job. We're back at 1045, so thanks everyone.